Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see your smiling faces out there today. Well, I want to give you a little bit of a flashback to 1976, and here is a picture of me on the left. You see me there on the left in the blue visor and the black hair? No, that's not me. Are you anybody awake here? Can you believe how red my hair was? I was 15 years old. Who knows where this picture's taken? This is Yankee Stadium, the only stadium, Yankee Stadium in the Bronx. This is the first year of the renovated New York Yankee Stadium. I was 15 years old. That's my mom. I'm assuming my dad is the one who took the picture. See how bright I am. So, and, and it is, we were there for this game, and uh, every year my folks took me to a Yankees game once a summer. We always tried to go on, have you ever heard of the word doubleheader before? They used to have doubleheaders. You guys ever been to a doubleheader? Two for the price of one. This was a twi-night doubleheader. Started at 5.30 p.m. And back then when baseball was baseball, the game was over in two hours and 20 minutes. And he could, then the whole two games was over by 10.30 at night. And so that's the way it used to be. Now it's all ruined and messed up, but that's another sermon. My brother wouldn't normally go with us. We had four tickets. I don't remember why he didn't go. Did he not want to go? But I asked my best friend, Joe, to go with me, and Joe said he would go. So we were best friends up until that day. Yes. And so when the first pitch was thrown by the Yankees, Joe became Benedict Arnold. Joe became Judas Iscariot. You see, Joe is a Philadelphia Phillies fan, and all of a sudden he became a Kansas City Royals fan. And I'm a Yankees fan. We paid his ticket. We gave him free transportation, tr free food. And at the, after the first pitch, he's like all in for the Kansas City Royals, cheering, hissing, yelling. I'm like, Joe, your best friend's next to you. Guess what? We are no longer best friends. What is wrong with people like that? Don't they have any intuition, any sense that if you're going to root against your friend's team, you root it silently. He doesn't even know that you're rooting against them because you gave him a gift to New York City. Guess how many times Joe went to the Yankees with us after that? Zero. Zero, absolutely. Well, we are in our series, Learning to Love Like Jesus. And it dawned on me this week that it's time to just get down to brass tacks and call a spade a spade and be honest. And the fact is this. It can't be done. It's almost like this whole series was a total waste of time, wasn't it? How do you love like Jesus when there's people like Joe in the world, right? <laughs> How do you love like Jesus when your neighbor's, you know, being a neighbor, your, your sibling's being a sibling, you know? And how do you do that because there's people in the world that are so difficult to love? Do you know anybody like that who's difficult to love? Hopefully you're not sitting next to them right now. It is impossible to love like Jesus. I'm just letting you know right now. We are asking you to do something that you cannot do. You cannot love like Jesus on your own because it is impossible. This Christian life is an impossible thing to do. It's only requires, it can only be done with supernatural power. Amen. And so today, I'm going to give you the secret to loving like Jesus. And it isn't going to be about you. So if you have a Bible, turn to Galatians 2.20. If you have a phone, turn, to, turn it on to 2.20. And if you don't have a Bible or a phone, just look up top at the screen. And let's stand and read this one verse. We'll look at a couple others, but this is the main verse. I want you guys to memorize this verse today, all right? You think you can memorize it? So let's read it all out loud together. Ready, set, go. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All right, let's pray. So Lord, right now as we look at this verse, as we unpack it, as we dissect it, would you dissect our hearts and may we come to the point of the cross today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. 
So how do you love people that you can't love, that you don't want to love, that you find difficulty loving? How do you do it? Let me bring out four points from this one verse. And the first is we need a new me. You need a new me. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. He's writing this now as a Christian. We'll talk about his previous life here in a minute. This means that Jesus is not in the business of reforming or rehabilitating people. He's in the business of regenerating people. You see, you and I have to die. We can't get better because we can't. We need a new life. And that's why Jesus said in John 3, 3, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Why would he say that if we could enter the kingdom of heaven by becoming a better person? No, no, no. You, that's religion. That's not of God. We have to die and become a new me. I've been crucified with Christ. And so two things to try to help us understand this is that I can't save myself and I can't sanctify myself. Let me say it again. I can't save myself, that is from the penalty of my sins, nor I cannot sanctify myself. If I'm on this side of the cross and I'm not yet a Christian, I can't save myself. And if I'm on this side of the cross and I am a Christian, I still can't sanctify myself. I can't do this on my own. I need a totally new life, and I need someone else to enable me to do so. Let me just explain again. Do versus done. Do is really a short word for religion. Humanitarianism, but especially religion. Do says, well, the way I get to heaven, the way I'm forgiven is I go to church more. By the way, we all should go to church more, all right? I believe in going to church, okay? If I get baptized, if I go to church and I get baptized, well, then maybe I'll be saved. No, that's not what the Bible says. What if you say, I'm going to stop cussing? By the way, I, I'm just bringing this up. I know no one in this church cusses. There are other churches that people cuss in, but not this church. I know you guys don't cuss, but you probably know people who do. You know what I'm trying to say? Stop partying. I'm not talking about Chuck E. Cheese and birthday parties. I'm talking about capital P party. You know what I'm trying to say? Does anybody live in the real world out there? I'm going to stop partying. I'm going to stop lusting. I know no man in this church does, but there are other men out there that lust. The, that, I'm going to stop. And then, you know what? I'm not going to stop doing all these bad things. I'm going to help the poor, right? And then, you know what? I'm going to obey the Ten Commandments. So I was at my office in McDonald's last fall, and I was talking to a lady I know, and I forget how it came up. She said, I know I'm going to heaven because I obey the Ten Commandments. I'm like, I know you. You don't obey the Ten Commandments. <laughs> She's 83 years old. I'm not going to tell her that she doesn't obey. I should have told her. I need to find a way to say, are you really sure that you obey the Ten Because I know she doesn't obey the Ten Commandments. In fact, I know none of you guys obey the Ten Commandments. Not totally, perfectly. Just not. A single person in this room has totally obeyed the Ten Commandments. You say, well, you know, what are some? some we don't even, she doesn't even know what the Ten Commandments are. What are some of the Ten Commandments? How about thou shalt not covet? You guys obey that perfectly? You know what I get really upset about is these people who have, you know, you know, 40,000 new cars with leather seats and people who have these huge houses. And then you got some people who have a beach house and a lake house and a mountain house. And then you've got, you know, you know they've got all these other things and they're always on vacations, you know. And they've they got people, professionals to take care of their yard. Don't you ever covet any of that? You know, I, I said last night about the beach house, and as I was leaving, saying goodbye to this one family, I said, so what's going on? Hey, well, for the next three weeks, we'll be at our beach house. <laughs> I was like, I guess they're leaving the church now. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't want a beach house. Who has time to clean a beach house, okay? But the point is this. 
We all have coveted something that somebody has. There's another thou shalt not. I know that none of you guys have perfectly done this one, except for parents. Thou shalt not lie. Right? Thou shalt not lie. Everybody's lied. Raise your hand if you've lied. Own up to it. Admit it. All right. One person hasn't raised their hand. I called a guy out last night. No, you're a liar, I said. I had to go apologize later, but he was okay with it. We do this on Saturday night. Saturday night is way better than Sunday. Saturday is Guy Kneebone unplugged. I say whatever I want to say because none of the elders come on Saturday night. I can do whatever I want to do. It's all true. It's all true. Have you ever made an excuse? I'm sorry we can't be there uh, at the party. I'm sorry we can't just make it because, because we, we have plans. I'm like, stop. How many times have you given an excuse and you fudged the truth? You lied. Everyone, we shouldn't lie. As parents, we teach our kids, my goal is never to lie, but I know in the past somewhere I have lied. You're not going to go to heaven. If you think it's by obeying the Ten Commandments, you cannot save yourself. Do means the good news is you don't have to try to save yourself because Jesus died for all your sins, even coveting and lying and lusting and cheating and stealing. You can't add or improve on what Jesus has already done because he died in your place. And so all we have to do is trust Jesus to save us from our sins. If we invite him into our heart and let him change us, that makes all the difference. Amen? That's Christianity and not religion. Question, are you sure you've died? Are you sure that you're a new you? Are you 2.0? Whatever your name, David are you David 2.0? Are you still David when you're trying to get to 1.9? You were at 1.1, then you got to 1.2, and 1.3, and 1.4. You're trying to get better and better and better, but trust me, you don't get to 2.0, you ain't getting in. You aren't going to have what you need to have. Romans 6.11 talks about, I cannot sanctify myself, because it says, so you must also consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Pastor Guy, what if I get on this side of the cross, I've asked Jesus in my life, well then you still can't sanctify yourself. Sanctify is, is a word that means to be, become more holy, to be more set apart and become more like Jesus. How do you become more holy, more like Jesus? Not by in your own effort, because you can't do it. You can't do it in your own effort. We have to acknowledge we've been crucified with Christ and consider myself dead to the power of sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Well, how do you do that? Well, that's point two of Galatians 2.20. Let's go back and read it about Christ in me. Galatians 2.20. For I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ, but Christ who lives in me. That's the key. But Christ who lives in me. So when you call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to save you from your sins and you want a new life, you are forgiven for all of your sins. And in addition to that, you're acquitted from your sins. You're declared righteous in the eyes of God. And on the side of the cross, now Christ comes to live in you. He enters you. You aren't just doing this. You aren't still here, but you're forgiven. You're over here. You're forgiven. And now he's in you. And only by letting him remain in you will you change. Because you can't do it on your own. How do you love like Jesus? By drawing on the power of Christ who lives in you. Now Saul, you remember Saul, Saul was a blasphemer, and he was a religious man. He was a religious Jew, and he was like the man because he believed Christians were wrong. He was having Christians arrested. They were taken in. They were being executed. He was breathing murderous threats against Jesus. And because when he goes on the road to Damascus, suddenly Jesus is like, I got to do something with this guy because this guy has to die. 
knocks him off his horse. He falls to the ground. He can't see. And Jesus appears in the vision and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? At that point, Saul didn't physically die, but he died. He went from Saul 1.0 to Paul 2.0. He had a new life. And, and here in Acts 9.17, it says that Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, that is Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. For, for years, Saul had physical sight, but he had no spiritual sight. He gets knocked off his horse. He's down the ground. He's now blinded. And Ananias comes to lay hands on him to give him back his physical sight, but to give him his spiritual sight. Amen? That's what happened. And he was what? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. You cannot love like Jesus if you aren't filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't do it. But if he fills you, if you allow him to fill you, to control you, and you yield to him, that's what it means to allow Christ to live in me. Christ lives in me in and through the person of the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, but he sent his Holy Spirit to live in you. Does that make sense? So you don't have to go, if you're like, I don't know if I can do this Christian thing. Well, no, you can't. But if you have the Holy Spirit, you can. And that's what makes it all good and fun. Right. Romans 5, 3 to 5 says, We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit has been given to us. The only way we can love like Jesus loves if we have allowed the Holy Spirit in our life and to be filling us and pour out his love in and through us. So what we need is we need to become a new man. All right, let me, let me demonstrate how this thing works, okay? I've got a prop up here. So, nice lamp, isn't it? You like my lamp? I stole it from the prayer room back there. <laughs> now, what do you notice about this lamp? It's not lit. And that's the picture of a non-believer. He's a lamp. He's just not lit up. Unfortunately, too many believers look like this, too. We're not lit up. But it begins with we need to get plugged in. But let me try to like turn this thing on. Okay. Okay. Just turn this baby on. Oh, it doesn't work. I wonder why this thing doesn't work. I don't know if this light bulb works in here. Let me take this new thing. What? What do you mean? Oh man. You're right. I forgot, I forgot. It's not plugged in. What is this? I thought it was battery operated. Um, if you want to love like Jesus and you're not plugged in you can't do it you got to get plugged in you got to receive Jesus Christ in your life and allow the Holy Spirit to come in your life and you've got to get plugged into the power source you can't do it on your own I don't know if this is going to come on or not Let's try. There we go. There we go. Last night it didn't work. <laughs> but it did. So this is a Christian who's plugged in and yielded. You can have the Holy Spirit, but quench him. Okay? Guys, you're online, and you're online porn, and you're online every night on porn. That's you. Not wrong to drink, but you're getting drunk all the time. That's you. Uh, you hate your brother. You won't forgive him. You even take communion. You still won't forgive him. That's you. You might be a Christian, but that's you. You've got to confess your sin. 
and yield again to God if you want to shine the light. And that's what this is all about. This is a supernatural life. We cannot do this on our own. We have to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. We have to let him fill us. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's I know who no longer live, but Christ who lives in me, right? You have to let Christ flow through you. And you do that by living by faith in the Son of God. Let's go back to this verse. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, that is in my body, I live by faith in the Son of God. I have to love people by faith. You're like, okay, my homework assignment today is now I'm going to love that person that I can't stand. You know what? It would be so much easier to pass to just teach Bible doctrine and theology. Week one, God. Week two, Jesus rose from the grave. Week three, the Holy Spirit is the member of the Trinity. Week four, baptism by immersion. Week five, communion is a symbol of our faith. Week six, the church. Week seven, uh, predestination. Well, that's not week seven yet. Week, we'll get to that week hundred, okay? We, but all, all I do is teach head knowledge. You're like, oh, I put that in my head. I put that in the nugget in my head. I put that in my head. And you walk out and you got a big head full of theology. But you know what? That's not what God's called us to do. He's called us. You will know them by their love. And to live the Christian life is way harder than to learn about the Christian life. It is pretty easy to learn about the Christian life. And people like learning about the Christian life. Problem is, it's so much harder to do it than to, to know it, right? Yeah. It's so hard to love like Jesus because it's impossible. Because I've given you a homework assignment for four months, and you guys haven't gotten any better yet. Anyway, I'm just kidding, okay? All right. Forgive me. Rewind that, okay? Just the elders. Anyway, just rewind that. Just kidding. The truth is, I want to ask you, have you gotten better at loving like Jesus since January? I hope you have. I hope. Have I? Have I gotten better? You know, you can worry or you can have faith, right? I'm counseling a couple last week. Their wedding's on Saturday. Well, everybody has a cell phone, but the problem with smartphones is it only tells you the weather like seven, eight days ahead. What's the weather going to be like in, the, in 13 days? And, and, and all stressed and worried about the weather, I'm like, well, if you decided to have an outdoor wedding, that's on you, Right? <laughs> When I got married, no one even heard of outdoor weddings. We had them in the church where you're supposed to have your weddings, right? <laughs> Lori and I, our biggest worry wasn't, was it going to rain that day, was because 10th Presbyterian Church didn't have any air conditioning. How hot is it going to be in this dumb church we're stuck in for the next four hours, okay? Lord, it was 86 degrees. It was sort of hot. People were using fans. Whatever. We should have just eloped. But anyway, no, we didn't get, we want to get presents then. That's, we don't want to do that. All right, anyway, whatever. Let's get back, back on target here. You can't control everything. You want to have an outdoor wedding? Okay. Let me tell you what could happen. It could be windy. It could be overly sunny. It can be rainy. It can be cloudy. It can be hot. It can be cold, okay? I stood outside in a 95-degree temps with a, just sweating down my head at somebody's wedding about 10 years ago. I've stood at the beach in Ocean City in pouring rain with a groomsman with an umbrella over my head. You, I, I'm going to get paid anyway, but you, you're you going to have to put up with your wedding, okay, if that's what you want, all right? But if you're worried about your wedding, you better do one thing. We're having too much fun today, right? You have to tone it down for the 11 o'clock service. You're going to have to give it over to God. Because it's not that important. The weather is not going to make your marriage. You better make sure you pick the right person. And if you've got the right guy, ladies, or the men, you've got the right woman, you've got a gift of God, and that's all that matters, and you leave the weather in God's hands and trust him, and you're going to have a great day, whether it rains or snows or pours or is windy, because he will be there, and that's why we want to worship, because he's in this room, and that's all that matters, because you cannot predict your life, and you cannot love by faith. You can't get over worry unless you just leave it with God. You've got to quit trying to live the Christian life. Okay, here's a slide. Instead of trying, trust. Instead of trying, trust. Pastor Guy, I'm trying really hard. What's your problem? 
Because what did Jesus say? Uh, John 15, 5. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me. Let's say it out loud together. You can do nothing. Let's say it again. You can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Oh, I'm trying real hard. That's the problem. You're trying, and you can't in your own strength change, but you have to let Christ who lives in me as you yield to him, he changes you. You just wake up with a new attitude because he changed you because you prayed about it and you gave it over to him and you let him through his Holy Spirit change you because we cannot change ourselves. You know anybody who you like, I wonder when they're going to change, right? You know who I'm talking about? <laughs> okay. But the Lord can change you. Whatever it is that you're struggling with as a habit or whatever it might be, I promise you, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, He can and He will change you. Maybe not overnight. You may not go from a 1 to 10, you might, but you will gradually change. And then it can become muscle memory because it's part of just walking in the Spirit. Some years ago, A.J. Gordon, who was one of the founders of the Gordon Conwell Divinity School, was walking uh, across a field, and he noticed a house in the distance. And as he looked towards that house, he saw a man pumping at one of those hand pumps. And as he was looking, he noticed this man was pumping you know, up and down, up and down. And it seemed like he just was pumping furiously. And, and he never even stopped. He never even stopped to catch a breath. He kept pumping and pumping and pumping. And so Gordon's like, this is a remarkable sight. And he watched for a minute or two, and the man's still pumping. And so he decided to walk closer towards the house. And he began to walk to the house. And as he got close, he realized, that's really not a man at all. It's a wooden figurine painted to look like a man. And so the arm that was doing the pumping was hinged at the elbow, and the hand was wired to the pump handle. And so, you see, it looked like the wooden figure was pumping the water, but actually it wasn't doing any of the pumping at all. You see, it was an artesian well, and the water was pumping the man. And that's how this works, the Christian life. We don't do the pumping. We keep our hand on the handle. We keep our hand on Christ. And we let him pump the water through us. And we change. Instead of trying, trust and yield to him. So first, the new me. Are you a new me yet? Have you let Jesus in your life? Second, Christ who lives in me. Third, I live by faith in the Son of God. And fourth, who gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In one of the Psalms we read earlier today, I mean, not, we didn't read, we sang. Maybe some of you read it. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. It's in Christ alone who loved me. He loved you. Pastor Guy, I don't love that like that person. Well, I don't like them maybe either. But did you know that Saul, when he was persecuting Christians and having them executed, at the same time, Jesus was still loving him. Jesus died for his sins, and Jesus was going to call him to himself, and Jesus would change him. And Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, because even Jesus died for your enemies. Now, yeah, 
I'm not going to die for my enemy, but I'm not Jesus because I don't have the love of Jesus like I should. But he died for the people you hate the most. He died for the people who you love the most. But being a Christian, we don't get to decide who we like and who we love. Do you understand? We are called to love the whole world. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That is Christianity, right? And that's what we must remember. He loved me and gave himself for me. If you think you are unforgiven and can't be forgiven, no, you're wrong. He loved you. He died for you. You just need to apologize, repent, and believe and let him in. At the same time, if you're going to love someone who's hurting you, who's persecuting you, who's taking you to court, who's ripping you off, who's offending you, who's just making fun of you at school, who's picking on you, who whatever it is, who's cheating you, who you just don't like the way they look, whatever it is, you're going to have to remember who loved Jesus, who loved me and gave himself for me. And he calls us to give ourselves for them too. As the worship team comes up, I want to close with a story I came across not too long ago. So back in the 50s, mid-50s, a young man by the name of Tom Skinner, Tom Skinner later was known as the Black Evangelist, and that's how the New York Times and other writings referred to him. Tom Skinner, as a teenager, was converted to Christ while he was the leader of the largest, toughest teenage gang in New York City called the Harlem Lords. I did a little more research about this last night. The Harlem Lords had the juniors and the seniors. The juniors were ages 12 to 14. The seniors were ages 15 to 17. I believe he was the leader of the seniors of the largest, toughest teenage gang in New York City. In 1956, he heard on a radio, on radio and also amazing, his father was a pastor, and he's a leader of the biggest gang in, New York, in Harlem. His conversion was so real that he left the gang the next day. He turned from a life of fight and violence to preach the gospel. And immediately there was a victory over crime and cruelty in his life. And soon there was also a victory over hate and bigotry. And several weeks after his conversion, remember he's still a teenager, he's playing a football game in which his assignment on one play as a lineman was to block the posting team's defensive end. He did such a good job blocking that end, knocking him over. The halfback got the ball and ran for a touchdown. And after the play was over, the boy he blocked and knocked down legally on the play, jumped in front of him. In a rage, he slammed him in the stomach. Skinner fell over. He hacked him on the back. And he shouted at Skinner, you dirty black nigger, I'll teach you a thing or two. And Skinner said that under normal circumstances, the old Tom Skinner would have jumped up from the ground and just pulverized this white boy. But instead, he got up from the ground he looked at this boy in the face. He said, you know what? Because of Jesus, I love you anyway. He said later, he was surprised himself that he said that. But he said, if I'm going to believe in this Lord who forgave even me, how can I not love this other man? After the game was over and this young guy had enough time to think about it, he came up to Tom Skinner and he said, you know, Tom, you did more to knock prejudice out of me by telling me you loved me than if you'd have just knocked me in the jaw. Oh, make no mistake. When Jesus says, turn the other cheek, he means it because it works. That is Christianity on trial. That for God so loved the world, that we are to love our enemies, and we can't do that. We can't love like Jesus because we're, we're sinners, we're imperfect, but if we get a new me, a new Guy Kneebone, a new Ridge Kelly, a new whoever you are, and you let him in your life, and then you stay with your hand on the pump handle, and the water will pump you, and he will change your life, and you'll start to love people you don't like. Why? Because Jesus is in you, and you're in Jesus, and the Spirit's filling you, and this is a supernatural life, and we have got to live like that, but not in our own power, right? Because we can't do it. We have to be on our knees and say, Lord, every day, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I just want to know today, 
Are you filled with the Holy Spirit or are you just trying to be a Christian? It's a whole difference in this. And are you a new man, a new woman? Are you sure Jesus, you've led him in your life? If you're not sure you've led Jesus in your life, today is the day, now's the time. Let's stand and give your life to Jesus right now. Wherever you're standing, if you're not sure that you're on the other side of the cross, you may have gone to church your whole life, you may have thought it's about obeying the Ten Commandments and getting baptized and doing good and trying to be better. That's not what the Bible says. If you want to right now say, Jesus, I need a new life. I believe you died for all my sins. Just tell him right now, Jesus, would you come in my heart? Would you save my soul? Would you come live in me? Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Would you forgive me my sins? Breathe a deep breath. And let him in. And Christian, if you've put the flame out, if you'd poured water on the light and the flame, it's time to turn that light back on. Put aside whatever it is that's grieving God and yield back to him today. We love you, Lord. We praise you, God. Thanks for meeting with us today. You're an awesome God. And Jesus, you are the great I am. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's worship God together.